So what's going on guys, DIY Dan here again, and in this video I'm going to be showing you how I repaired my 2017 Chevy 2500 HD with a Duramax diesel engine in it. I had the check engine light come on, engine power is reduced on the dash. Now when this engine power is reduced came on my dash, I was only able to get up to maybe 45 miles an hour. Uh, it drastically limits the amount of power you're going to get out of your vehicle. And the reason they do that is to protect the engine from serious damage because the part that went bad on my engine would cause the engine not to be getting nearly enough air for the amount of fuel that it would get. And a diesel running rich will overheat extremely fast. So I diagnosed this with a code reader. I did not have a proper Tech 2 scan tool and some self-diagnostics. So keep in mind that there are several other things that could possibly cause this reduced engine power to come on on your dash. It could be anything from just a loose wire connection to a turbo to what I ended up doing, which is the actuator. In all honesty, I really wanted to take it to the dealer and get it accurately diagnosed before spending this money on this part to make sure I was right. However, I did not have time to do so because this happened two days before we were supposed to go out of town with some of our friends with our toy hauler and I did not have time to get it into the dealership for them to diagnose it for me. Now, I did do this repair and it did end up working. We went on the trip, didn't have any problems pulling the toy hauler, and I've been using it ever since, and that's been over a couple weeks, driving the truck without a problem. So keep your expectations realistic as we go through this video, and irregardless, it's probably gonna give you some good information that you might not know. So let's get to it. So the first thing I did is I put my code reader on it. I got this P2599, which is a turbo vane position fault. I got a P0046, and that is a turbo boost solenoid performance. I got a P003A, which is turbo position sensor not learned. A B2A00 and a B2 two AAA. Both of these codes are no big deal. It is basically the ECM or the truck not liking my code reader. So after pulling all these codes, writing them all down so I had a history of it, I went ahead and cleared these codes out so I could see which one came back on my truck first after taking it for another drive. So after going on about a 30 minute test drive with no codes popping up, and me being on a time crunch, I decided against this method and started trying some other things. So the fact that those codes did not pop up on my truck again while I was doing my test drive was a little on the annoying side because then we're leaning back to more of an intermittent problem, which could be electrical and makes it more difficult to diagnose. So the one thing I did know is that by all the code descriptions, they all related to the turbo and the vane position. Now these turbos are variable vane, and that gives you more power throughout the entire throttle range. If you remember back in the day with older diesels that were not variable vane, that's why you had massive amounts of turbo lag, and you would have to get on that throttle and give it a couple seconds to get going. So with all the new diesels now, they all pretty much have this variable vane. There is good to them, the fact that you don't have that turbo lag. However, they do have a tendency to get stuck and this can cause a lot of these problems. Now on this truck, they actually went to an electric motor to actuate the lever that controls that variable vane. And one of the things they do to keep it from seizing up is when you go to shut down your truck, you'll actually hear the electric motor under the hood and it runs a couple cycles fully open, fully closed on the actuator lever to clear out any of that exhaust soot that possibly gathered on that variable vane before it just sits. So since I could not get any codes to pop back up on my little test drive that I did, I decided to unplug the connector out of the actuator motor that controls that variable vane to see what codes popped up and whether that engine power is reduced comes on on my dash again. Basically simulating an open in that circuit. So there's like 50,000 different kinds of connectors guys and each one works a little different. 
on this one. I think you're supposed to be able to push it back a little bit and then push this part of the tab down to get it to unlock. I couldn't get that to work, so I ended up using my pick, or you could use a small screwdriver like this one and pry up the little gray tab on the other side and then pull on the connector and it should come out. Once I got that off, I went ahead and started the truck up again to see what that would do as far as codes and whether that engine power is reduced is gonna come back up on the dash again. And it did, along with some exhaust fluid system and a laundry list of other codes as well. So after that, I decided to go ahead and do that actuator motor that controls that variable vane. And remember that it's always a good idea to disconnect both grounds on both of your batteries before doing any work on electrical. Now, once again, this is not 100% for sure diagnostic, but with 160,000 miles on the truck and the fact that that electric motor is constantly moving that actuator lever nonstop throughout the entire throttle range the entire time you're driving, there's no way an electric motor is going to last forever. And also the fact that it does not have an external sensor reading the variable vane position, that is also included in that electric actuator as well. So the other thing I did before condemning this actuator as well is I did video the actuator lever while I was in the truck throttling up and down to see if I saw any dead spots, but it was working. However, all it's gonna take is one dead spot in that actuator motor at a certain position to throw those codes and make this actuator no good. And I obviously left that video running while I shut the engine off as well to make sure it was going through its little shutoff cycle to clear out any soot that had built up on that variable vane. Now I did see these actuators online for less than $700. However, I was in a time crunch and had to get it done immediately. So I did have to get it from the dealership. So right here, I'm actually removing the lever that attaches the variable vane of the turbo to the actuator. Now that can be a little bit of a pain. I actually have Allen sockets that I put on a quarter inch ratchet. And I believe it was a four millimeter, but don't quote me on that because it has been about a month since I put it on. So once you get that lever off, you're gonna to wanna to push that back and forth to make sure it is very smooth and there's no sticky parts in the turbo itself that could cause it to jam up and overwork the electric motor that is in that actuator. And the other thing you obviously don't wanna have happen either is a premature failure of the new actuator after spending $700 because it is sticking and jamming it up and causing it to overwork as well. Once making sure that my turbo was free and there was no sticky spots in it, I went ahead and took the four nuts off that hold this actuator to the bracket. I had to deal with the luxury of the fact that I had to get this done and I had to work on this when it was hot. So I ended up grabbing some gloves so I didn't burn my hands. But if you have a chance to let this thing cool down before doing this project, that would be a good idea. So at first I thought this actuator wasn't gonna come out of here without removing a bunch of other crap. However, after moving the lever a little bit and messing with it, I was able to get it out of there and it was a very tight fit. So after getting that out of the way, I went ahead and moved that lever going to the variable vane again. And I got a little better video of it this time to show you to make sure that it was completely free and I didn't feel any sticky spots in that turbo. If that rod is not moving very freely or it has a sticky spot in one location, that means you might need a turbo or a cleaning. I have not had to do a cleaning, so I'll have to look to a different video if you want to try that. Then I went ahead and grabbed the new actuator and moved the lever a little bit and got it down into place. So this is the only tricky part about installing this actuator, is there is a nut that goes on the back side of the lever that the rod attaches to with the Allen head bolt. And I had to use a magnet to get it put in place because I didn't want to drop it while trying to install it. Now, if I would have thought about this sooner, I probably would have just put a dab of silicone to hold the nut in that lever before putting it down into place. However, I did not think about that until editing this video, but my magnet and my little screwdriver worked well. Make sure you don't lose that nut while you're removing that actuator as well, because you don't want to have to try and dig that nut out of the engine valley. I thought it was attached to the lever at first, so I didn't worry about it and got lucky enough where it did not fall out while I was removing it. Then using that small screwdriver, I held that nut in place while I got the rod end 
attached with the Allen bolt and got it started before setting it the rest of the way in place. The other reason you want to be really careful about not losing that nut is it is a crush nut and that is to help keep that rod from ever possibly backing off while you're going down the road. So if you do lose it for whatever reason, make sure you get a crush nut to replace it with. So one other helpful tip guys, getting these nuts started can be kind of a pain. And what might help you out is if you take a little part of a plastic bag and put it in your socket, then you can push the nut in that socket with the plastic and it will hold that nut from falling out. This can come in very handy when trying to get a nut started in an awkward situation. And I had to use it on three of the four nuts that I had to install on this actuator. Once getting the four nuts tightened down all the way that hold the actuator to the bracket, I went ahead and finished tightening down the Allen bolt on the rod for the variable vein to the actuator lever. And that's about all there is to it, guys. Once getting everything tightened down, go ahead and put the ground cables back on your batteries and get ready to fire it up. I went ahead and cleared the codes after that, and I haven't had a problem since. Hope you guys enjoyed this video and it gave you some good information. If so, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I'd really appreciate it. I've got all kinds of DIYs on my channel, all with the same intention. Give you guys the most information in the least amount of time as possible so I don't waste your time. Have a good one. See you next time. Later.